to, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I have to say that uh, being at this event makes me feel pretty positive about the future of our civilization and all these young, really uh, energetic people, so I really appreciate it. So my story today centers around one of the great outstanding challenges that's, uh, that's facing our generation, and that's building what are known as, as quantum computers. Uh, these are machines that have the potential to, to really profoundly transform the technology similar to the way in which ordinary computers that we use all the time have changed the way we live our lives today. Uh, this is not a new problem, so this quest has been ongoing for uh, quite some time now. And uh, really, physicists from around the world have, have devoted their, their entire lives trying to bring this technology to life. So fortunately, we may be entering a, a golden era uh, in this quest. And as I'll try to uh, describe later on, uh, there's recent breakthroughs that have, uh, at least me and, and no many other people, optimistic that the tools needed to finally build a quantum computer uh, might be within our reach. So to, to illustrate why quantum computing is special, I'd like you to first imagine a world where various impossible sounding things would happen. So in this world, uh, you would be able to uh, walk through walls. You could uh, be awake and asleep at the same time. And, and you and a friend could be sitting here in this room, while at the same time the two of you could be off somewhere on the other side of the planet. What I've just described to you is actually the world according to quantum mechanics. In fact, uh, uh, all these uh, bizarre occurrences are happening all the time before our very eyes. Uh, not with people, unfortunately, but instead uh, with the atoms that make up everything around us, everything in this room, including ourselves. So for example, an atom can actually move through a wall, and an atom can be in two very different places at the same time. And I know that sounds like science fiction, but actually the ability for atoms to behave in these strange ways is actually crucial to the universe as we know it. So we wouldn't actually exist if, if uh, atoms couldn't behave in these strange ways. So quantum computers, uh, they take advantage of these uh, strange rules afforded by the quantum, uh, quantum world to process information in a manner which is fundamentally impossible with ordinary computers, no matter how, how powerful you make them. So if, if you I think about just an ordinary computer, the types that we have today, the information there is stored in some string of zeros and ones called bits. So why, that's, why that is, it's not so important for what I want to say. Uh, those zeros and ones are just some convenient way, have to be a convenient way of digitally storing information. Uh, quantum computers store quantum information, which can encode uh, many different strings of zeros and ones at the same time. So this is similar to the way in which an atom can be in two, uh, two different places at once. What this means is that a quantum computer can effectively encode the information in a vast number of, of ordinary computers at the same time. Now, as you might imagine, uh, this additional freedom that, uh, that's allowed by quantum information uh, enables quantum computers to uh, wildly outperform even the most powerful supercomputers of today, at least when it comes to solving a certain types of problems. In fact, there are some kinds of problems that if you try to solve them with an ordinary computer, would take you literally the age of the universe to do that, which is a super uh, ridiculously long time. Uh, if you tried to solve the same kinds of problems with a quantum computer, you could do that essentially in the blink of an eye. So for example, uh, the way in which we currently encrypt data over the internet relies on certain problems being very, very difficult for uh, ordinary computers to solve. But if we had a quantum computer, uh, we would be able to easily override those, those encryption methods. And, and this uh, leads to uh, lots of applications for quantum computers uh, in areas ranging from uh, personal privacy all the way up to national security. And for this reason, uh, a lot of governments are, are very interested in, in bringing this technology to life, particularly before somebody else that beats them, beats them to the punch. So quantum computers can also provide us with a much more efficient way of, of simulating nature. So uh, this might allow us to uh, understand and predict the behavior of many atoms that exist inside of materials. Uh, predicting that behavior turns out to be another problem that's extremely difficult to solve with uh, ordinary computers. But if we had a quantum computer, we could easily, easily attack these uh, problems in a very uh, profitable, profitable way. So to a theoretical physicist like myself, I'd be very interested in using uh, that ability to simulate nature to try to uh, unravel some of the great mysteries that have been uh, baffling physicists for, for decades. Uh, on a more practical level, uh, the ability to simulate nature, chemical and biological systems, uh, could allow us to design new kinds of drugs, new medicines which target specific uh, diseases, fight aging, and things like that. If you think about it, it's actually quite an quite amazing feat of, of uh, uh, intellectual achievement uh, that 
we've been able to anticipate any of these applications of quantum computer since they really don't exist yet. But almost certainly, this only scratches the surface of what quantum computers would actually be able to do for us. Of what quantum computers would actually be able to do for us. So very likely, uh, the full potential of quantum computers would only become evident once we actually had the hardware available so that we could experiment with them so that people like you in, these, in this audience could actually tinker with them and figure out what they're actually capable of. Uh, so I mentioned already that quantum computing is not, uh, is not a new subject. People have been working a long, long time uh, to try to, to, to build this technology. Uh, yet despite these decades of effort, uh, if I go to Best Buy right now, I can't, uh, I can't order a quantum computer. So why is that? Why, why is this uh, such a difficult problem actually to, to realize? Well, the main bottleneck turns out to be noise. Your quantum computer is never fully isolated from its surroundings. And what this means is that if you're, say, trying to encode on information in the property of some atom, some property of an atom, well, a, a stray beam of light might leak into your quantum computer. It could strike that atom and therefore corrupt the information which, which it was trying to, uh, trying to store. So this kind of noise uh, tends to downgrade our precious quantum information to the status of ordinary information that's, that's present in a single laptop. So that, uh, that uh, quantum character, which is absolutely essential to the applications, which I just mentioned to you, uh, is vanquished by the noise. So in a nutshell, uh, quantum information tends to be exceedingly fragile, and that's the reason why uh, building a quantum computer has proven to be such a monumentally difficult problem. Now to overcome this challenge, there are roughly two ways that you could envision uh, proceeding along. So first of all, you could try to increasingly shield your quantum computer from the environment to the point where the level of noise was so low uh, that it, it simply didn't matter anymore. So whatever re residual noise was left over, you would be able to correct for after the fact. So that, that approach is kind of like trying to build a better and better radio, uh, better antenna, and so on, so that any, any static that's coming over your receiver just becomes inaudible. Now, in the long run, that might be the way to go. We, we really don't know at this point without uh, having succeeded in this endeavor. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the t a completely different method, method of attack. And that's to figure out a way of encoding the quantum information in a way which is intrinsically immune from the noise in the first place. Now to illustrate how this might be possible, I want to go through a bit of a detour now. And I'm going to introduce to you a, a, a concept known as Moore is Different. So Moore is Different is, is actually a very general principle. It has implications all throughout nature, not just physics, but actually much more generally. So I'm going to introduce what Moore is Different means uh, using a visually striking example of birds. Uh, what I'm about to show you are, are two videos of birds. So one, uh, one is a video of just a single bird flying, and next to that will be a, a video showing an uh, enormous number of birds all flying together. There's probably thousands of them. Let's see, here they are. Oops. Uh, okay, so there we go. So I have to say, I never get tired of, of watching these, uh, these images. I think it's, it's really quite, uh, quite amazing. Um, so I think that the idea of more is different is immediately obvious by comparing these two videos. So this massive collection of birds is forming these very, uh, very uh, coordinated uh, flocking patterns, with very highly coordinated motion. What a bird is doing on one side of the flock is very closely linked to what a bird on the other side is doing. It's almost like this flock is behaving like a, a single giant organism. So this, uh, these elaborate flocking patterns have absolutely no analog if you think about just one bird. So this is a phenomenon that really requires large collections of, of birds to exist. So this is essentially what more is different means. More is different means that uh, the behavior of many is qualitatively different from the behavior of a few. Uh, another visually striking example of more is different uh, is provided by water. So we know that water is made out of water molecules, H2O molecules. And when you put a, a large amounts of those water molecules together to get seawater, once again, lots of new phenomena uh, emerge. So uh, seawater can uh, exhibit waves, tsunamis, uh, whirlpools, vortices, things like this. Once again, none of those phenomena have any analog whatsoever if you consider just one or even a few water molecules. So once again, more is different. More is different also in the, concept, in the context of atoms. The behavior of an individual atom is vastly different from the uh, behavior of, of the gargantuan number that exists inside of any piece of matter that you can hold in your hand. Now, the, the result in this case is a spectacularly diverse array of interesting phenomena that uh, here emerge from the, from the choreography that quantum mechanics provides for the atoms inside of the materials. So in a sense, quantum mechanics organizes a sort of 
uh, intricate dance among the, uh, among the constituent atoms, which underlies lots of really interesting, interesting physical behavior. So let me start by giving you two examples that are probably familiar to, to everybody here. So one thing that can happen when you put lots of, lots of atoms together, you can get uh, the formation of, of magnets, refrigerator magnets that stick under a refrigerator, uh, crystals, another thing that's a, you can see with the eye, crystals. Again, neither of these things have any analog if you're just thinking about uh, one or even a few atoms. An even more striking, but uh, probably less familiar example, are, are forms of matter that allow you to literally levitate giant uh, people carrying trains. And these trains can then uh, glide across the track, similar to the way in which a hovercraft, uh, hovercraft floats across water. That technology actually exists. It's pretty amazing. So the most remarkable uh, implication of, of this more different idea, in my view, is that matter can even, in some sense, give birth to new kinds of particles uh, that are completely different from the individual atoms that make up the material. So these, uh, these new particles are also, by the way, uh, completely different uh, from the electrons, protons, and neutrons that make up individual atoms. They're completely different species altogether. They can't actually live, up, live on their own. They really require this large collection of atoms uh, to, to exist in the first place. And to me, they're really the ultimate manifestation of this uh, more different principle. Now to tie this uh, back to quantum computing, it's these new kinds of particles which may be the key ultimately to building quantum computing hardware. So let's imagine that we, that we use these new kinds of particles to uh, encode quantum information. The key idea here is that a noise from the environment is simply blind to their existence. So precisely how that happens is, is a bit subtle, but essentially the information that they encode is now buried in some collective uh, property of many, many atoms at once. So by using these, uh, by using these particles, we've safely hidden this quantum information, quantum information from the environment. So the noise is still there, it simply no longer matters. So that's the beauty of this idea. Now the quantum information is also uh, processed in an interesting way using these new kinds of particles. If you want to take your string of zeros and ones and, and change it to another string of zeros and ones, what you do is you play a sort of shell game with these particles. You take them, you take a pair, and then you move them around each other, sort of like braiding strands of hair. You braid these particles. And when you, when you start braiding these particles around each other, what you're doing is you're changing the collective uh, state of those atoms in, in a way in which you as a user control, depending on how you created those particles exactly. And this has the effect of changing your string of your zeros and ones to a different string of zeros and ones. So that's how, that's how uh, uh, quantum computing takes place with this particular scene. What I've just described to you here is a, a really revolutionary approach to, to quantum computation. I didn't actually invent this uh, idea, I really wish I had, especially because uh, very recently the person who did uh, invent this approach uh, won $3 million for coming up with this idea. So the person who did invent this uh, is, is uh, Alexei Katayev. He's actually a local to this area, he's, he's also a professor at, at Caltech. You may have actually seen him at some point, maybe in a grocery store or something like that. And not necessarily realize that you, know, you, you just uh, saw uh, really one of the most brilliant uh, theoretical physicists that's, that's currently around. So his, his brilliant insight really changed in a profound way how people think about this problem of quantum computation. And certainly his uh, three, million, three million dollar prize was, was uh, very, well, very well earned. The billion dollar question though remains, uh, remains unanswered. And that's how do you actually build the hardware to make a quantum computer as Alexei Kintaev uh, envisioned it. This is not an easy problem to solve. Finding a, a piece of matter that, that cooperates to give you the new kinds of particles that you need in order to, to uh, accomplish this, this job uh, is not easy. If it were easy, then odds are I'd be able to already give this, uh, this presentation using a quantum computer, but we know that that's not uh, yet possible, unfortunately. Uh, so the good news is that there has been a recent breakthrough in how we approach this problem. And it's this breakthrough which has me and, and lots of other people uh, in this business very excited about the prospect of quantum computing as I've described it to you here. So if you were to now, uh, if you open up your laptop and look inside, what you're going to find is a, a series of very carefully designed uh, computer chips. And the technology that goes into making those computer chips nowadays is extremely well advanced. And that's why our, our, our ordinary computers are so powerful. What we're learning how to do now is take the very same types of materials that go into making those chips and then uh, modify them in, in some relatively simple way to generate the, precisely the new kinds of particles that we need to make a quantum computer that is imbued from, from noise. 
So in effect, we're, we're learning how to leverage the uh, very well-advanced technology that goes into making ordinary computers to make uh, hardware for next generation quantum computing. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was an experiment uh, from a group in the Netherlands that uh, demonstrated the feasibility of this idea. And this experiment got many people uh, really, really excited. Um, this made a big splash both within the physics community and in the popular media. You can read about this experiment in blog, blog posts uh, in various places. Uh, in fact, this experiment was, uh, was rated one of Science Magazine's Breakthroughs of the Year for 2012. And that's a, that's a pretty uh, significant honor um, since it's, uh, it's granted to only a few of the most pioneering discoveries in all fields of science, not just physics, uh, for that year. Now, admittedly, there's a very long way to go uh, from this prototype experiment all the way to working on quantum computing hardware. And I wish I could give you a timeline and you know, some probability that will actually make it all the way to that finish line. I don't know. Time will tell. But what I can much more confidently say is that uh, uh, the journey towards that finish line will almost certainly be paved with uh, lots of interesting discoveries along the way. So we're going to figure out how to, how to make matter behave in new ways that it's never you know, behaved in before. We're going to expand the horizons of what we understand about quantum mechanics. We'll discover, we'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate new aspects of the quantum, me of quantum mechanics in the lab uh, that, that we've never seen before. And almost certainly we'll have to develop new physics paradigms uh, uh, to accommodate all these new discoveries. And to be perfectly honest with you, I'm a theoretical physicist. I don't actually try to build this hardware. And uh, what really energizes me the most about this problem is not this finish line, but it's the journey. So, so what, uh, what makes me excited every day to think about this problem is this, uh, this prospect of, of discovering new things about nature, re really new things about the universe that nobody in the history of humanity has, has appreciated before. Um, of course, if we actually make it all the way to that finish line and, uh, and happen to overcome what's, what, again, been one of the grand challenges uh, of our generation, of course, that's, that's all the better. I'm going to leave you now with, with a comic, uh, which I, I just uh, learned about a couple of days ago, that just perfectly uh, encapsulates my thinking on this problem from the point of view of being both an advocate for science and also a scientist that's actually in the trenches trying to uh, bring this technology to life. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention.